Hi everyone, Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter here. Uh, sorry that this video is so late. Not only did my wife and I move, but we have a wonderful little baby boy now. A lot of stuff did happen in September for paleontology, so we're going to go into that, and it's hopefully still going to be October when we release this video, so it shouldn't be technically late. Let's start. Large theropods evolved many times in many different clades. The allosaurs weren't very closely related to the tyrannosaurs, for example. One of the big questions with these large theropods is how would they run? With so much large body mass and such relatively small area to balance that weight on with just two legs, it becomes a very difficult question to begin trying to answer. However, a new study has sought to do just that. What they found is that larger theropods, greater than a ton, would tend to prioritize efficiency over speed. And that's one of the main ways that they would have been more effective in hunting. Small theropods, like some of the raptor dinosaurs, such as Deinonychus, could have very easily begun running faster because they would need to catch more smaller prey in order to become successful and feed themselves. Meanwhile, something like Tyrannosaurus rex could run slower as it only needs to catch one prey item to get the same amount of value out of the hunt. Effectively, what this means is that in small theropods, we can get very high speeds relative to their body size, especially when compared to the large theropods, which very much prioritized running safely and efficiently over running quickly. One very good example of this is in the Tyrannosauroids. Small animals like D-Long were able to move at these quicker speeds as they weren't very big. But as the group began becoming larger and larger, eventually evolving into things like Tyrannosaurus rex or Tarbosaurus batar, we can see how they slowed down in order to conserve energy as they only needed one successful hunt instead of many small successful hunts. There are two main hypotheses for where teeth came from. The first is that gill arches in fish had some teeth-like projections, which eventually were moved into the mouth and hardened to become the teeth we know today. The other is that scales on fish started from the outside and migrated inwards in order to help grab onto prey and hunt. A new study suggests that the second hypothesis is more likely the case. A section of skull from an ancient amphibian was cross-sectioned and cut in half. Inside the layers of bone, there were some palate teeth, teeth that lay on the palate rather than on the sides of the mouth like in most animals today. As the animal grew, new layers of bone would come in and cover up some of these older palate teeth, eventually completely covering them. This sort of action is something that's similarly seen in some of the older fishes, which do have the same kind of patterning of overlaying scales rather than teeth. This helps to indicate that the same kind of thing was happening in the early amphibians, where bone would grow over the palate teeth as they were essentially just modified scales. Carcharocles megalodon is the largest shark to have ever lived, with some estimates putting it as far as 18 meters long. However, a newer study suggests that it was much more likely closer to about 15 meters, which brings it from about 60 feet down to about 50 feet. Most studies on the size of megalodon use teeth to try and estimate how big the fish would have been, and some of these studies use teeth from different parts of the mouth. This current study use teeth from the center part of the mouth to try and get a better idea of just how big it would have been by having a more consistent metric by which to measure and estimate the size. This kind of methodology of being very consistent with measurements is important so that we can ensure exactly what we are measuring and how it relates to other parts of the body. For example, we might find a more complete megalodon, and there is one being studied right now, that could indicate that the teeth in the center of the jaw aren't as good of an indicator of size, which could reverse this study. But right now, it is the best that we have. And this kind of consistent convention is something that we need to look for in all of the sciences. The KPG extinction, which killed off the non-avian dinosaurs, saw the use of two different studies using core samples to try and get an idea of what happened during the extinction. The first study looked at fossilized plankton after the impact event at the end of the Cretaceous. What it found is that the plankton immediately after the event were much smaller and there were many, many fewer species of them. However, they did rebound fairly rapidly, becoming large again, however not gaining that same diversity. 
What this indicates is that the overall carbon cycle in the oceans had more or less recovered in just a few hundred thousand years after the extinction. And while that seems like a lot, in geologic time it isn't very significant. This kind of intermittent recovery would be occurring for about the next 1.8 million years, and helps indicate that even without the same kind of biodiversity that existed before the extinction, the environment did somewhat recover even before that same biodiversity was reattained through evolution. What this means for us is that we still need to study extinctions, as we are having a large amount of biodiversity loss right now. And even if our environments recover, we still don't know exactly what kind of shape they will be in after that recovery. The second study used core samples from the actual Chicxulub impact site, where the meteor struck the Earth 66 million years ago. By analyzing the layers of rock that lay immediately under the crater, an idea of what happened in the surrounding area can be better attained. What the scientists found is that first, all of the water would have been pushed out of the way by this giant meteor coming in, which makes a lot of sense. This would have caused massive tsunamis and flooding across many parts of the land nearby. It also found that the meteor, when it crashed into the crust, melted a lot of it and turned it into lava. Much of this would cool before the water returned and came back in, but it still helps to show just how powerful this impact was. As the water came rushing back in, small cracks would allow the water entry into the rock, this still very, very hot rock. This would then turn the water into steam, causing steam explosions, which fractured and cracked up to 10 meters of rock. Above this are 80 meters of the rocks that were broken, but not melted by the impact. All of this consolidated into a single group of rock called breccia, with many angular pieces being laid out, again, for 80 meters, a massive amount of rock to be laid down in such a short time of potentially just a few minutes. Finally, the tsunami that was pushed onto the land came back to the impact site in full force, bringing with it rocks from the lands where it was pushed. Included in this rock are pieces of charcoal, which helps to indicate that global wildfires were started by this impact, as has been proposed by other researchers. The rocks that are in the surrounding area are rocks like gypsum and anhydrite. Both of these contain sulfur, and in the crater site, there isn't any of these rocks. What this most likely means is that the impact created so much heat that these rocks vaporized and went into the atmosphere. Sulfur in the atmosphere helps to deflect and diffuse sun rays, cooling the planet. It's been suggested that this kind of cooling from the impact could have cooled the planet to below freezing temperatures from almost pole to pole for anywhere from a few decades to a few hundred years. With so much going on in just this one extinction and this one event, it becomes even more important to study all of the extinctions in history so we can get a better understanding of what our environment is going through today and what kind of sudden changes might affect it. Not a published scientific paper, but announced in September 2019, is a new species of Jurassic crocodilian coming from New Mexico. Found in the Ojito Wilderness area by Bob Chesbro and his two sons, this species represents something entirely new to science. The first crocodilian from the Jurassic of New Mexico. What Bob did is very important as well, as he called the local Natural History Museum and had them come out and examine the fossil while it was still in place. This is something that's underestimated a lot, as a lot of the rock around the fossil can give a lot of information for what kind of environment it lived in. Additionally, the museum was then able to contact the Bureau of Land Management and make sure that the excavation of the fossil was legal and done properly. With these public lands containing fossils, it becomes very important that we make sure that these fossils are put into the right hands at museums so that they can be studied and further help human knowledge. This fossil helps to show that not all fossils are found by professional paleontologists. And in fact, sometimes just random people on walks can go and find fossils. But also that it's very important that we contact the correct people for it so that these fossils can be studied in full detail. During the Pleistocene, Australia saw diprotodonts, essentially giant wombats, as the main large-bodied herbivore on the continent. However, there was also another group very closely related to them. A recent study of this group, the paler chestids, shows that they had a much different feeding strategy when compared to animals like Diprotodon. 
While Diprotodon and its kin would have been feeding on low-lying plants, the Peller chesteds had much more developed arm strength and large claws on their hands to help pull down tree branches. This means that they would have been essentially behaving somewhat like a giant ground sloth, in that they would be going to different trees and pulling down and feeding on leaves or fruit on these trees. This helps to show how convergent evolution plays a very big part in our understanding of the natural world, and additionally, how two large-bodied herbivores could have coexisted in the same environment together, with the diprotodons focusing on smaller, low-lying vegetation, and the paler chesteds feeding from the trees. Dinosauromorpha is a clade which includes not just the dinosaurs, but animals that are very closely related to them, such as the Silosaurs. Silosaurs have been mostly seen as omnivorous animals. However, a new one coming from Colorado seems to show that it was an entirely herbivorous species. Quantosaurus William Parkery helped us to understand exactly what place that the Silosaurs might have played in the Triassic ecosystem. Most of the dinosaurs coming out of the North American Triassic sediments are overwhelmingly carnivores, with things like Coelophysis. This could have very much given the Silosaurs a niche on the continent, which at the time was a part of Pangaea and connected to all of the other continents. However, animals from South America and Africa, such as Massospondylus, could have began migrating northwards, with these large prosauropods outcompeting the Silosaurs, eventually leading to their extinction at the end of the Triassic. Some researchers have argued for a sixth major mass extinction to be recognized in the fossil record coming from the Middle Permian. While this extinction would only precede the extinction at the end of the Permian, the most devastating extinction the planet has ever seen, by a few million years, it should still be a significant point of study. A new study looks at evidence that helps to point out the validity of this idea of a sixth mass extinction in the Middle Permian. In reef environments, many sponges, which would use calcite as their skeletons, ended up dying out during this period, even before the end Permian mass extinction. Additionally, rugose corals, which were some of the most prolific species to be reef builders during the Paleozoic, also almost entirely disappeared, and also used calcite as a large portion of their skeleton. All this points to some sort of major turnover in the oceans, which likely was caused by the Emeshian Traps, a series of massive volcanoes, this time coming from South China. So while we can definitely point out some major changes happening in the oceans, there were also some changes happening on land. Pelicosaurs, such as Demetrodon, began dying off during this time period and being replaced with animals such as the Gorgonopsids. And this kind of pattern wasn't just found in predators. Animals like Edaphrosaurus were also replaced by Periosaurs. So it's something that did very consistently happen on land as well. One of the main contentions about this sixth mass extinction has been what happened on land, as there doesn't seem to be as significant as an ecological collapse as has happened in other extinctions. That is to say, the Demetrodons were replaced with Gorgonopsids, which effectively just filled the same niche as beforehand, rather than having a catastrophic collapse of the entire environment, food chain, and ecosystem. What this does mean is that we do need to keep an eye on the oceans, as, again, there was definitely a mass extinction in the oceans, particularly among the sponges and corals, which use calcite and are very susceptible to ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is something that we are seeing in very strong quantities today, meaning that we need to take this extinction or potential extinction very seriously, as even if it didn't occur to great extents on land, it still might have had some effect, and it needs to be further studied before we can say for sure or almost for sure, that there weren't major effects on land. As we continue to attempt to protect our oceans, this kind of extinction needs to be something that we are very aware of, as if we can prevent this same kind of thing from happening in the modern day, we stand a better chance of being able to deal with even worse catastrophes in the future. Hi everyone, thanks for watching, you know, baby and stuff, it's all exciting. This one's late, but life. I'd like everyone to take care, be safe, don't go extinct.